Welcome to the first video for IV Biology. Um, these are going to be our notes and some of our lectures throughout this semester and throughout the year to deliver information to you um, kind of in a flipped classroom manner. And so the first video of the year and of our, our first main unit is Cell Theory and Introduction to Cells. Uh, cells are a basic uh, fundamental building block of life. They make up all organisms on life, and we're going to talk about those a little bit today. And really, the ability to see uh, cells and our understanding of cells has progressed quite a bit throughout um, our history and really kind of started in 1635 uh, with Robert Hooke. And he was the first to use the term cell. Um, he named it after a small cubicle that monks would live in. Uh, he thought it was similar to a cell. And when he looked at cells under microscopes, um, he was actually looking at corks, uh, cork he thought that the two were similar to what the monks would live in and the, the shape of what he saw, and so he called them cells. And really the important part of that is before Robert Hooke actually started looking at these things under the microscope, um, uh, before the development of the microscope, it wasn't possible to see these different really small microscopic things that make up life. And so the development of microscope, uh, which today now seems pretty basic, but at the time that was very cutting edge technology. And we'll be talking about this throughout the year, how technology helps us to uh, make advancements in our understanding of science and make new discoveries. And so at the time, this development of the microscope was a major impact, had a major impact on um, science at the time and the ability to actually look at cells uh, much more closely. Um, <clears throat> another scientist that kind of contributed to our understanding of cells is uh, Anthony von Leeuwenhoek. And he is Dutch, and he was actually the first discoverer of cells. Uh, he's kind of the father of microbiology, and he observed single-celled organisms, and he came a little bit after uh, Robert Hooke. And some other people contributed to our understanding of cells. Uh, one of those was Louis Pasteur. You've probably heard of Louis Pasteur before. Uh, you've probably heard of Louis Pasteur before because uh, Pasteur is the name that we use when we talk about pasteurizing milk. Um, basically to make milk safe for consumption. Um, and so Pasteur did an experiment that kind of uh, was similar to a previous experiment done by Francisco Reddy in 19, uh, excuse me, 1668. Uh, and that original experiment was looking at uh, putting meat in three different types of jars. The first one was an open jar, the second one was covered with gauze, and the third one was sealed. And so he wanted to see whether uh, eggs, maggots, would develop on these different uh, meats in the different jars, and the first one, not surprisingly, uh, maggots developed on the meat. On the second one, even though flies couldn't get into the, uh, get onto the meat, maggots developed because they were able to lay their eggs and they dropped down onto the meat. And the third one, not surprisingly, nothing developed. Pasteur did a similar experiment where he heated uh, broth or uh, uh, some liquids that would be uh, helpful or allow for life to develop. And uh, he had a couple different types of containers. The first one had an open top. Um, the second one had a cotton plug, and the third one had a kind of U-shaped uh, tube on it. So it wasn't exposed, uh, things couldn't drop down into the actual broth. And so he heated those up to kill everything off, and then he let them sit for a while. And the first one that had just had an open top uh, eventually became contam contaminated with bacteria. The second one that was basically plugged be uh, was remained sterile, and the last one uh, with this U-shaped top on it remain sterile as well. And so what Pasteur gathered from this is that um, all living uh, cells come from pre-existing cells. Uh, life doesn't just spontaneously appear. Uh, life comes from pre-existing pre life. And so all of these experiments and all of these scientists um, put together uh, help lead to our understanding of cells and something that we call the cell theory. And there's three parts to the cell theory, one, two, three. Um, the first one, all living things are made up of one or more cells. We'll see that. We're actually going to look at some prokaryotes and some eukaryotes, some single-celled organisms and then some multi-celled orga organisms. Uh, cells are the smallest unit of life. They're the smallest living things. And as I mentioned previously, cells come from pre-existing cells. There's four things that all cells have in common. They share these, uh, these four things that they all have, uh, whatever type of cell they are. And the first one that they all have is a cell or a plasma membrane. Uh, in our textbook, plasma membrane uh, is the word that's typically used to describe 
Um, basically, it's the barrier or the membrane that surrounds the outside of the cell. You probably remember that from uh, biology previously. But the plasma membrane is what basically decides what enters and leaves the cell. And we're going to take a much closer look at the plasma membrane uh, a little bit later on in this unit. The second thing is ribosomes. And ribosomes can be found in a couple different places in the cells, and we'll look at that. Uh, but their primary function is to make proteins. And proteins are really the essential part that uh, help to control and to carry out all the basic functions of both the cells. And if it's a eukaryotic, eukaryotic organism, if it's a multicelled organism, it really controls everything that helps the organism to survive and to reproduce and to grow and uh, to, to live. Um, this, the third thing is DNA. All, all cells have DNA uh, of some sort. Uh, the amounts vary and the location of where it's found also varies, but all cells have DNA. And lastly, they all have a cytoplasm. And the cytoplasm is kind of the gooey uh, gel stuff that's inside of the cell. This is, if this is our plasma membrane here, the cytoplasm would be underneath or inside of that. And it kind of just holds everything together. That's its primary function, its primary job. There's two types of cells that I've been mentioning, prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Eukaryotes are broken into plants and animals and are typically multi-celled. Uh, prokaryotes are often uh, single-celled. Uh, they're a little bit more simple. They're a little bit less complex than eukaryotes, but they're still very important, and we'll talk about both of these as well in the next couple of days. And lastly, uh, one of our last slides here, all living organisms carry out functions nece necessary for life. So regardless of size, all living organisms are able to maintain and to carry out the functions that are, are needed in order to survive. Metabolism, uh, response to stimuli, balance or homeostasis, growth, reproduction, nutrition, gathering some sort of energy. That can vary widely for the different types of species, uh, but all species need some sort of nutrition and some energy. Um, and this also includes unicellular organisms that are usually uh, prokaryotes, sometimes eukaryotes, some examples of unicellular eukaryotes could be protists, fungi, bacteria. Um, but every type of cell carry out, carries out uh, the functions that are necessary for growth and, and for survival and for life. So obviously when we start talking about multicellular organisms such as humans or uh, you know, cats or dogs or, or any larger organism, even plants for that matter, um, there's obviously lots of different parts that make up uh, those organisms. And so if we start at the most basic level, we have an atom uh, that goes on to molecule chemicals um, that develops into organelles, cells, tissues, organs, uh, a system, and then the organism. That's basically the hierarchy or the development of basic building blocks, atoms, to an organism. Um, and within an organism, such as a human, there are very different types of systems that help to make up that, or that organism. Uh, for example, we have stomachs, livers, intestines, and each of those different organs, organs have different types of cells. Uh, your muscle cells have very different cells than your skin cells or your nerve cells. They're all different shapes and sizes. And so really the thing that controls how all of this works together is DNA. And so within DNA uh, is something called genes. And hopefully you remember our discussion of genes from biology. Uh, genes are short segments or long segments in the DNA strand that are responsible for a specific job or a specific function or purpose. Um, they code or they have the information, the instructions for the cell to do a specific thing. And cells become specialized or differentiated by gene expression. And so genes can be turned on or off at different times depending on things that happen around them. Uh, things that happen inside or outside the cell can turn on or off these genes at different times. I actually in college took a whole class that looked at developmental biology and how gene expression um, can basically allow for the development of organisms and how these genes turned on and off can uh, cause cells to um, become different things at different times. Um, we're going to continue to look at this. This is a really interesting uh, aspect of development in biology. Uh, it basically produces cells that are specialized in specific structure and function. So, um, as genes are turned on for the development of stomach cells, like the, the cells that uh, line the inside of your stomach, um, they have a specific structure and a specific function. And cells are eventually organized into tissues and organs in a specific arrangement. 
And so this is just kind of an introduction to cells. We're going to look at prokaryotes and eukaryotes more in the coming days and talk more specifically about differentiation for cells and how uh, they can develop into different types of cells within organisms based off different signals.